In the classes I teach, we spend a lot of our time looking at superbly crafted essays. Um, I choose specifically uh, things that I think are excellent craft examples, and we pick them apart trying to appreciate and copy that craft. But we also need to have the skill of detecting when something is not well crafted. So I'm going to show you an example of an essay that's not doing a particularly good job by the standards of this class, and why. Um, to fully grasp the standards that I, as your teacher, uphold, uh, and the standards I hope to pass on to you, you need to be able to see them from both sides, um, including failure to meet them. So the essay that I've chosen for this purpose might be familiar to you if you've had me for a class before. I picked it because it's already available online. Anybody who wants to can already see it for free. Uh, and it wasn't written by a student of mine or anybody who I know. So here you can, uh, to find it online, you um, can go to this website, go to boomerwomenspeak.com, click Our Voices from the menu at the left, scroll all the way down to the blue bar that says Contest Winners, and it's the first one under that. Um, and uh, I advise you to print it out and number the paragraphs so that you can follow along in the discussion. All right, this piece has a number of problems of craftsmanship, including large and small ones, and I'm not going to try to deal with every single problem. Um, I will leave that as a possible exercise for you uh, if you want to pick out new things that I didn't even gripe about. Uh, but I have um, picked out what I think are the most important mistakes, the ones that I hope to steer you away from by this negative example, and the ones I would try to work with this author on if she were my student. In a way, all the, uh, all the problems that this piece has are related to each other. Um, they all have something to do with oversimplification. Not caring enough about the actual people the author is writing about in order to draw their portraits in an accurate human way. Uh, and not caring enough about the reader's freedom to get to draw his or her own conclusions. Georgia Richardson knows from the very start what conclusion she wants you to draw. Uh, she announces it right up front in the title, and then she whams it home hard with no room for any nuances or doubts or complexity. You could call this problem themitis, or message disease. Ms. Richardson's message has swelled up so big in her head that there's no room for her to care about anything else. And she doesn't want her reader to be off her leash for even a second because then they might start caring about something else. Uh, she's letting her end, her artistic goal, justify her means. If I have to lie a little bit to make it turn out the way I want, that's okay. If I have to use force on the reader, if I have to use force on my own characters, that's okay too. It's for their own good. It's for morality. It's for good to triumph in the end. Those are artistic attitudes that I don't approve of. Okay, more specifically, I'm going to go through and pick out problems one at a time, starting with the title. Uh, this title, in my opinion, is a truly terrible title, The Christmas I Learned to Love. Uh, when I first read it, not knowing what was coming, uh, I just had a bad feeling from the title alone. I was hoping there was going to turn out to be some kind of twist on it um, somehow by the end, uh, some irony or something, uh, but there wasn't. This is a preachy title. It says, pay attention kids, this essay is going to tell you how to be a good person. And then if you just skip right ahead from the title directly to the last paragraph, it delivers the exact same message that the title delivered. No change and no surprise and no growth. That's not good, that we make no progress at all, from title to final simple moral. I feel insulted by how simple the moral is. Am I a kindergartner? A theme that's worthwhile is not so easy to package. That's why people write narratives, to do justice to complex themes. Now, the fact that the title stakes out a thematic territory is not a problem in itself. Good titles also quite frequently point toward theme. 
uh, they don't have to, um, but it is a common titling strategy to try to hint at what is your deepest or your most important meaning. Hint, I say, important word. Titles give you some clues to the narratives about us. They can shape your reading experience, but they don't shape it so restrictively that there's nothing new left to experience while you read. Uh, they don't over control you to the point where you don't have to bring in your own mind and your own judgment. So when you're writing your own work and making your own titles, um, I want you to err on the side of being too subtle rather than too explainy. So what if your dumber readers don't understand everything you wanted them to get? That's better than insulting your smarter readers by over controlling them. Uh, or by talking down to them. Titles don't even absolutely have to be theme related. Uh, they might point you to something else, um, some significant image from the piece, something that's memorable or emotionally rich. Uh, and as discussed in the theme video in the narrative element series, uh, theme itself, at least what I call t theme with a capital T, even that is kind of optional for a writer. As a rule of thumb, when you're composing a piece of writing, I want you to do the title last. Uh, that way it will definitely come after you've made some of the discoveries that you're going to make while writing. Uh, and this is intimately related to my advice about letting your theme bubble up as you work rather than assuming that you know in advance of the process everything that your work will be about. If you start right off the bat with your title slash theme the way Richardson did, you limit yourself in advance, closing off interpretive options for you and your readers both. All right, proceeding past the sucky title, um, there's eight paragraphs total, and the most fully realized scene comes in paragraph two and three. And this, in my opinion, is the strongest part of the essay. In these paragraphs, we get at least a little sense of what the protagonist is like. A 10-year-old girl who has some pretty strong feelings about what types of clothing she does and doesn't want to wear, and a little sense of entitlement about what kind of presents she deserves to get for Christmas. I don't think I would call this girl unusually immature for age 10, but whatever. Then in paragraphs six and seven, this slightly bratty person undergoes a transformation, drops her sense of entitlement, and feels grateful for what she gets. But paragraph six and seven don't create a scene to the same extent paragraph two and three do. We don't have that same level of description. We don't experience Christmas morning along with her. We're just basically told that the change has occurred. Okay, what else do we know about the girl, about the other characters, about the setting that they all inhabit? Almost nothing. We learn in paragraph five uh, about the dad's profession, he works in construction, and that he's underemployed and that the family is on hard times economically. Uh, it's not clear whether that's the first time the girl knew anything about their um, relative poverty or, or not. That's all we got. It's a problem that the author doesn't care about her characters enough to want to show them to us in detail. She does come the closest in the second and third paragraph, but then after that she pretty much gives up on characterization. After that she's always just racing forward toward her moral. But that's not what I read for, um, to be told by somebody how to be a good person. I read because I want to spend some time with other personalities. But there aren't any other personalities in here after paragraph three. I get a little introduction to the girl, just enough to get interested, but then she's yanked away from me before I can watch her develop at all. Let's take a look at paragraph four. I heard voices, come from the, uh, voices coming from the living room and it sounded like arguing. I heard my daddy raising his voice in anger and bitterness. These lines set up a certain narrative expectation. 
when you read these lines, you think, oh, right, here comes some conflict. Uh, conflict, which according to some people at least, is what drives plot forward. And certainly at the end of paragraph four, I was looking forward to paragraph five. What's going to happen next? Well, what happens next is Richardson pulled that chair right out from under me. She promised an argument, but there wasn't an argument. Um, she said she heard anger, but then there's no anger on display, except in the most abstract and fleeting sense that the guy wishes he had more jobs and he's a little frustrated, but he's not mad at his wife. He's not mad about the kids. She's not mad at him. Neither one of them thinks the other one is less than perfect in any way. Real people, when they're suffering from poverty and frustration and feeling like a failure, they quite frequently take it out on the people around them. Sometimes they have disagreements about how to handle the little money they have. Sometimes there's resentment between husband and wives. Sometimes men resent their kids, all those mouths to feed. Nothing like that happens in our essay. It almost seems like Richardson started out that she was really going to show an argument, and then she stopped herself. She's like, no, I have to have the girl discover how to love, so there can't be even one second where her parents are anything other than perfectly loving. See, everybody? This is how couples should treat each other in hard times. Yeah, but what about how they actually do treat each other? This is supposed to be nonfiction. If I'm going to get something here that I can use in my own real life, it should resemble real life. Now here's the thing in paragraph five that totally lets me know that Richardson is lying to me. The dialogue. When you put words in quotes like this, it means it's supposed to be the actual words that the person actually said. Otherwise, it's just narrator summary of information and it doesn't go into quotes. But there's no way whatsoever that these are the actual words that two people sharing a household said to each other. Dad comes home and he tells mom, quote, construction work is down everywhere, unquote. Like she doesn't already know that. Like it hasn't been an issue for a long time already in this household. She's the one who's at home figuring out how to scrimp on Christmas using homemade presents. He might as well come home saying, hi, honey, I'm home from work. Actually, I haven't happened to mention this to you before, but it's been several months now that I've been underemployed, so we can't have nice things this year for Christmas. I'm sorry to surprise and disappoint you with that news on Christmas Eve. It's ridiculous. People don't go around making speeches to tell their family stuff they already know. At least they don't do it like this, all nice and loving. When they do, it's mean. For your information, dear, construction work is down all over. That I could believe. What this man says, I don't believe. What's going on in this paragraph is not true dialogue. It's just Richardson performing a kind of an information dump. She's using the man's mouth to provide the reader with some information that she wants the reader to have right now. I'm sorry, but that's cheating. If you want the reader to know stuff, you either let the narrator provide that information directly, or you build it into scenes and dialogue somehow where the reader is able to glean that information for themselves by observing the scene, sneaked in around the edges of scene detail. Fake dialogue like this, that's character abuse. One last major topic. The religious orientation of this family, or at least the mother, is revealed in paragraph five and six. But this is the first time we heard of it. This should be part of the setting of the story, right? People live somewhere and there's a certain cultural background that they grow up with and that's part of the shaping of their character and or it's one of the things that they struggle against, um, part of the conflict. So where did this story take place? We don't know exactly, but we can make some reasonable guesses. It's probably not in Saudi Arabia or Papua New Guinea or India, right? Um, the name Lida May uh, makes me think of the American South, but in any case, this is clearly set somewhere where the dominant religion is Christianity. 
Now the narrator is taking it for granted that her readers are Christian, like she is. That's not an assumption that you can make, even in this country. At the end of paragraph 5, Jesus just comes out of nowhere. Before this, we haven't seen anything about the little girl's religious upbringing or her own religious feelings, if any. Uh, we haven't seen anything about the family's religious practices and beliefs. Yet the narrator uses her narrator authority to say that Jesus died for our sins uh, at the end of paragraph 5 and again at the end of paragraph 6. And she assumes that you, the reader, will not find that controversial as a statement of fact. Doesn't everybody already agree that Jesus died for our sins? In fact, they don't. Worldwide, only about 30% of everybody believes that. And even in this country, in the US, it's only about 76%. So you're not allowed to assume that your reading audience only consists of people from within that 76%. But that's exactly what Richardson has done. Okay. Does that mean that you can't write about religious beliefs and religious feelings? Not at all. You just can't assume that your beliefs are universal or that the only people that you need to care about as an artist are people who already share your beliefs. How can you even be a good missionary for your own faith if you only preach to the converted, right? Uh, I can offer you an example of an essay where a devout Catholic manages to write about his faith without falling into the same error that Richardson did. So um, I, I am prepared to provide you with uh, uh, an excellent example, counterexample. Um, Barry Richardson's essay, Madre de Dios, uh, that was published in Best American Essays a few years ago. And I will be happy to let you borrow that book if you want to read it. None of my criticisms that I made of this essay should be taken as a criticism of Richardson's basic human decency or even her artistic intentions. I think that it could be potentially exciting and a very promising idea to try to dramatize a moment that probably every person has at least one of in their life, uh, a pivotal moment where we somehow in the middle of our childish selfishness, we somehow suddenly have some kind of um, at least partial understanding of what our parents go through for our sake and our brothers and sisters. Uh, and I would like in this essay to spend some time actually realistically exploring what that pivotal experience feels like for the young Georgia Richardson. More time than she let me spend, actually. Um, I don't think usually that our comprehension of our parents' feelings usually goes from 0% to 100% overnight, just like that. Check out paragraph 3 again. Uh, the ugliest skirt I had ever seen. And then in paragraph 7. The most beautiful skirt I'd ever seen in my life. Okay, I'm not saying she didn't feel that way on Christmas morning. Maybe she did. But what happened later, when she had to actually wear that homemade skirt to school. That's the story I want to read. Can she keep on feeling all saintly when she sees the rich girl in the white coat she wanted? Or when mean girls laugh at her clunky clothes? Or when that same, at least that she first thought was ugly, skirt keeps on hanging in her closet for years? Let me tell you what I enjoyed most in Richardson's essay. There's a complex image uh, that evolves in paragraph 2 and 3 again. Um, the box that holds her Christmas present uh, and she hefts it in her hands and she feels the heaviness of it as something desirable because she believes it holds the winter coat that she wants. So while she thinks it's the desired present, Heaviness stands for luxury item. Then when she gets the box open and she realizes that uh, it's a stinky homemade skirt, um, the heaviness of it is now something quite undesirable. Uh, quote, paragraph three, coarse natty material that quote, weighed a ton. Suddenly now 
heavy stands for poverty, stands for the opposite of the elegance she was imagining before. Heavy equals clunky and ugly. So she has uh, one image that is absolutely turned on its head within a few seconds just because we have a new piece of information. If you're feeling worried about how critical and picky your teacher seems to be, let me point out a couple things. Um, first of all, if Richardson were my student and she turned this essay into me for a nonfiction assignment, I wouldn't give her anything worse than a B minus. Uh, there is stuff here that she can work with. Uh, mainly, you need to downgrade theme and upgrade character and setting. Um, concentrate on building some scenes that will let us share the character's experience to a greater extent. Particularly establish the religious background in advance before it's needed in paragraph 5. I would also consider um, allowing the piece to go longer uh, and include scenes from both earlier and later uh, than the, the Christmas time revelation itself. Um, and if you want to take this further, students, here are several suggested exercises. Um, try just envisioning what that improved essay might look like. Uh, what scenes could you or would you include? Um, ask yourself, what would make a good title? Since you're not Richardson and you don't know what her experiences were, you can't just make up stuff from her life, unless you want to write fiction, of course. That's totally acceptable. I have a student who did that a few years back, and I will post her um, short story on our website for your edification. Uh, but nonfiction students, you can write a parallel essay from your own life that either aims at a similar theme to Richardson's or that tries to use an image in the interesting way she, she did with the heaviness of the skirt. Can you think of an object from your own life whose emotional significance got um, turned upside down?